Hello everyone. Hi. Thank you for typing in uh, what part of the world uh, you are joining us from today. It's so nice now that we are one global community today. We have participants from all time zones. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you all. On behalf of the International Pollutants Elimination Network and our co-sponsors today, the Endocrine Society and the Alaska Community Action on Toxics, we warmly welcome you to this global webinar about the human health threats from chemicals in plastics. I'm Leah Esquilio, IPEN's Programs and Policy Coordinator. Co-facilitating uh, this webinar with me is Ms. Eileen Lucero, Steering Committee Member of IPEN and the National Coordinator of Eco Waste Coalition Philippines, which is IPEN's hub for Southeast and East Asia. Hello, Eileen. Before we proceed, please allow me to share these reminders. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made public on IPEN's YouTube channel. Language interpretations for Arabic, Bahasa Indonesia, French, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish are available. You may click on the interpretation button down below and choose the language of your choice. We have three speakers today. We will have one or two questions after each presentation but there will be a longer Q&A toward the end of the webinar. Please type your question using the Q&A button below. Lastly, we would like to invite you all to complete the post-webinar survey later. To formally open our program today, I'd like to invite Griffins Ocheng, co-chair of IPEN's Toxic Plastics Working Group, to give the opening remarks. Yes, Griffins, go ahead. Oh, the thank you very much. Hard. Sorry, uh, sorry. Just at the point you're introducing me, my internet dropped. So um, I lost. No problem. What you're it's saying. okay, thank Griffins. You. Thank go you ahead. very much. Yeah, uh, welcome all, as Leah has mentioned, to this uh, uh, webinar. My name is Griffin Socheng. I'm the co-chair of the IPEN Toxics Plastic Working Group, and I will provide you a bit more information of IPEN and opening remarks. So I would want to share a presentation just to, to take you through. Uh, one moment. Yes, we can, Griffin. OK, just thank you. Please, thank you. Uh, Let me put on slides. Uh, yes, thank slide. you very much. So just to have uh, uh, this opportunity to welcome you again, and uh, just to give you more information about IPEN. Uh, as I said, I'm the co-chair of the Toxics Plus uh, Working Group. IPEN is a participating organization in 125 countries, and it's a global network of NGOs working for toxics free future. Our mission as IPEN is to work for a toxics free future, uh, linking local, regional, and global efforts to prevent harm from chemicals and waste. Uh, IPEN theory of change is globalizing local concerns and localing, localizing global policies. Uh, as you may know, uh, as experts in this uh, webinar, every stage of the life cycle of plastic is associated with hazardous chemicals. And as our mission is to see a toxic free future, uh, uh, the use of hazardous chemicals in plastics is a big concern to IPEN. This starts from extraction uh, to production, to use uh, recycling and the toxic recycling that happens in, in around, around the world, as well as incineration and uh, dumping in, in landfills. So this uh, releases uh, toxics and hazardous chemicals that harms human health mm -hmm. and the environment. So as IPEN, we have generated uh, a lot of data and information related to the hazardous chemicals in plastics. Uh, this is just a slide showing uh, a number of reports that IPEN has produced and can be found in the IPEN website. So this range from toxic additives and the circular economy to pops recycling that contaminates uh, children's toys to toxic soup and uh, the hazardous chemical that's mainly found in plastic products, a report that was released uh, especially in Africa. So IPEN toxic plastic campaign goal is to eliminate the toxic impact of chemicals in every phase of plastics. Uh, life cycle that is from production to disposal 
uh, and I want to give you this link that shows uh, that gives you the uh, web link uh, to various resources that IPEN has produced, especially on the toxic uh, plastic working group. Uh, you get a number of uh, reports and information that can give you uh, uh, enough uh, knowledge uh, when it comes to the issue of hazardous chemicals in plastic. And with that, I want to thank you very much and uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar. Back to you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Griffin. Thank you for joining us today. Friends, let us now dive into our main agenda. Eileen will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Leah. Um, so in December 2020, the Endocrine Society and IPEN released the report Plastics, EDCs, and Health, an authoritative and comprehensive report that provides the current best knowledge about the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on human health. Decades of research show that plastics pose a threat to public health because they contain a host of hazardous endocrine disrupting chemicals that leach and contaminate humans and the environment. Joining us today are the experts behind this globally important report, and we're grateful that they're sharing their expertise and time with all of us. Our first speaker is the lead author of the report, Dr. Jody Floss. Dr. Floss received her PhD in physiology from the University of Arizona and performed postdoctoral research at John Hopkins University and the University of Maryland. Dr. Floss' research program is focused on determining the mechanisms by which environmental chemicals affect the development and function of the ovary. She has published over 250 peer-reviewed papers and is the recipient of the Patricia Sokolove Outstanding Mentor Award, the Dr. Gordon and Mrs. Helen Kruger Research Excellence Award, the Pfizer Animal Health Award for Research Excellence, the Women in Toxicology Mentoring Award from the Society of Toxicology, and the Society for the Study of Reproduction Training Mentor Award. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Jody Floss. Hello, and thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to talk about human health threats from chemicals and plastics. I am going to start the webinar by first giving an introduction to endocrine disrupting chemicals that are in plastics or EDCs in plastics. I first would like to acknowledge that the authors of the report and this presentation do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So thank you for this opportunity to discuss our publication that sums up the state of knowledge on endocrine disrupting chemicals. This publication is a summary of research on the topic of plastics, EDCs, and health, and included information from hundreds of peer-reviewed studies. EDCs are often present in the building blocks of plastics or as additives that manufacturers use to produce plastics. This diagram illustrates that about 275 million metric tons of plastics are used around the world each year. It also illustrates that a small number of these plastics end up being recycled, whereas many plastics are incinerated or end up in landfills of the ocean. For example, it's estimated that 20 million metric tons per year are incinerated plastics, 32 million metric tons per year are mismanaged plastics, about 8 million metric tons per year end up in ocean plastics, 215 million metric tons per year go to the landfills. 5 million metric tons are residual plastics. And we're creating about 270 million metric tons per year in new plastics. And again, just to emphasize that only a small number of plastics, roughly 10 million metric tons, are recycled. So attempts to develop more environmentally friendly forms of plastics, such as bioplastics, 
really haven't addressed this issue of endocrine disrupting chemical exposure. Now, as a result, we know that plastic waste contaminates the soil, water, and the food chain. And so humans and animals are being exposed to these plastic waste contaminants on a daily basis. We also know from data on chemical production that plastics and chemical production are set to increase. So this graph shows plastic production from 1950 estimated through 2050. And what this is showing is that global plastic production is dramatically increasing by millions of metric tons over this time period. And right here on this chart, this is about where we are here. And so it's predicted that we're going to continue to make and sell and use far more plastics as time goes on. Now, one huge issue with this is that reliance on plastic harms human health. We know that harmful chemicals are used during the production of plastic or as additives in plastic products. We also know that endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs can come from these plastics and block, mimic, or otherwise interfere with the body's hormones. Now, a major concern of this is that these EDCs can threaten vulnerable populations. At various times in the life cycle, EDCs can pose a huge risk to health. Mom and her baby during pregnancy are very sensitive to EDC exposure, as are young children and people going through puberty. We also know now that in aging populations, they're also vulnerable to EDC exposure. One other issue is that we know that these effects of EDCs coming from plastics can impact multiple generations. And so some of the effects are passed from grandmom to mom, to daughters and sons, to their children, et cetera. Now, many of these EDCs that are present in plastic have been linked to a variety of reproductive disorders, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and neurologic impairments. So this schematic here is just giving some examples of diseases or conditions that we know are linked to EDC exposure from EDCs and plastics. These include things such as breast cancer, genital defects, low sperm count, increased risk of prostate cancer, increased risk of obesity, diabetes, testicular cancer, asthma, and such things as ADHD and autism. Now, given that we know EDCs coming from plastic can affect human health, I wanna provide some examples of the chemicals that are in plastics and tell you a little bit more about each of these chemicals and how they can impact human health. The first example I would like to give is bisphenol A, which is often abbreviated as BPA. BPA is found in reusable food and beverage containers, it's present in food can linings, used in medical and sports equipment, eyeglass lenses, thermal paper receipts, and plastic water pipes. The problem is, is that BPA leaches from these products and gets into either landfills where it can contaminate wastewater, groundwater, and freshwater, or it leaches into food and beverages that people consume. BPA is listed as a substance of very high concern by the European Union, and it has been demonstrated to be toxic by hundreds of chemical studies. Now, in addition to BPA being toxic, there have been several BPA substitutes that have been shown to be toxic as well. So these structures show some of the different BPA substitutes which are um, known as BPS and BPF. 
This is just showing the structures of these substitutes. And one thing we know about them is that these BPA substitutes are also as toxic and in some cases more toxic than BPA itself. Now BPA has been shown to impact the brain development and behavior. Specifically, it has been, caught, it's been linked to increased anxiety, depression, hyperactivity, inattention, and behavioral problems. BPA is also a reproductive health toxicant. Several studies in animals and in humans show that it reduces fertility, increases the risk of PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and causes sexual dysfunction in men. We also know that BPA exposure is associated with an increased risk of cancer. It is associated with breast, prostate, ovarian, and endometrial cancers. Now, in addition to BPA being one group of toxic chemicals from plastics, another group of chemicals are phthalates. Now phthalates are used in products to promote flexibility and reduce brittleness in plastics. They are used in PVC or polyvinyl chloride products. They're used as solvents in personal care products, used as fillers in medications and dietary supplements. They're used in food and beverage packaging, children's toys, as well as in medical tubing and IV bags. Now, plastics containing phthalates are a concern because we know from many studies that phthalate exposure has adverse effects on human and animal health. Phthalate exposure has been shown to reduce testosterone and estrogen levels in both animals and people. They've been identified as reproductive toxicants and can interfere with ovarian, uterine, pituitary, and hypothalamic function. They've been shown to block the ability of the thyroid hormone system to function properly. And they've been linked to an increased risk of diabetes and obesity. Now, a third type of chemical that is present in plastics that we're concerned with are a group of chemicals called perfluorinated chemicals. This is a group of thousands of surface active industrial chemicals. Their structure consists of very strong carbon fluorine bonds, which makes these compounds very stable. They do not significantly degrade in the environment and hence they're called forever chemicals. Now, because these perfluorinated chemicals have water and oil repelling property, they are used in diverse applications ranging from food packages and nonstick cookware to impregnation of clothes, furniture, and other textiles to improve stain and water resistance. They are also an active part of firefighting foams which has caused groundwater contamination close to military and civilian airfields, as well as fire training areas. <clears throat> They're also used in various food contact wrappers, lubricants, carpet treatments, paints, and cookware. And some of these perfluorinated chemicals are used to make the polymer polytetrafluoroethylene which is also known as Teflon. Now we're very concerned about perfluorinated chemicals and of these chemicals, the most studied perfluorinated chemicals are known as PFAS and PFOA. These chemicals have been used since 1940 and human exposure to these chemicals has been linked to many adverse health outcomes including disruption of the immune systems, liver, blood lipids, and thyroid function. They've been shown to lower birth weight, alter the onset of pu puberty, increase the risk of breast cancer, and they have been associated with kidney, testicular, prostate, and ovarian cancers, 
as well as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. These chemicals, because they are highly, people are highly exposed to them and they have been shown to be toxic, they have been listed for international restriction in the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants due to their persistent properties. And lastly, I'd like to give an example of alkyl phenols. Alkyl phenols and the rethoxylates are a family of high production volume chemicals that are surface active and also known as surfactants. They are used as detergents, emulsifiers, solubilizers, and dispersing agents in various products. For example, paints, homes, and industry detergents, pesticide formulations, and personal care products can contain alkyl phenols. Alkyl phenol ethoxylates end up in waterways and are common contaminants in the environment where they break down to degradation products such as nonophenol. These compounds are toxic and have persistent and accumulative properties. Alkyl phenols were among the first EDCs discovered in the 1990s due to their estrogenetic properties in cell culture plastics. And today they're still commonly used as additives in plastics that come into contact with liquids. Now, because of the common use of these alkyl phenols, Again, they're present in latex paints, pesticides, industrial cleaners, detergents, personal care products, and plastics. We're concerned about this use because they are known to have adverse effects on health. So alkyl phenol exposure has been linked to male infertility, low sperm count. They've been shown to disrupt prostate development, increase the risk of male cancers, and increase the risk of female and male breast cancer among those people that are occupationally exposed to alkyl phenol. So with these examples, I am going to stop now and I'm happy to answer any questions. And next I will turn over the presentation to Dr. Laura Vandenberg, who will give exists additional examples on the human health threats from chemicals and plastics. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions during the break. So first question, Dr. Floss, is there a safe alternative substitute for plastic production? So thank you for that question. That's a great question. So I think some potential substitutes instead of using plastic are when possible to use glass containers. They do not have some of the harmful chemicals that we see in plastic. Some other alternatives that I've been hearing about are using utensils and dishware that are made out of steel and other metal products, which also most likely do not have some of the same EDC levels as we see in plastic. Thank you, Dr. Floss. Um, the next question is that um, you mentioned earlier that EDCs affect mother and the, its babies. So how can EDCs adverse effect transfer it from mother to her baby during pregnancy? So we think there are a couple of different mechanisms. When we're starting to see what we call transgenerational effects where exposures are affecting subsequent generations of children. And, and also this happens in animal models. We think that they're potentially epigenetic changes so that the EDC exposure is changing the epigenome, changing the structure of the DNA in a way that gets transmitted from generation to generation, causing long-term effects of these chemical exposures. And some of these epigenetic changes could be due to changing the methylation status of DNA or changing histones in the DNA, as well as other potential types of epigenetic changes. Thank you, Dr. Floss, for that answer. Um, the last question for this is that, um, you, you mentioned that uh, is there any safe alternative substitute 
to BPA, given that BPS and BPF is also toxic? Yeah, so I'm not aware of any good substitutes for BPA. Um, particularly do not think that the BPA um, substitutes BPF, BPS are, are good substitutes. And I noticed in the chat, somebody is asking if plastic products that are labeled BPA free are really free from plasticizers. Unlikely that they're free from plasticizers. Um, some of them have BPA alternatives in them, such as BPF or BPS. Some of them are using other compounds that have not been studied in detail to know enough about whether they are dangerous, but most likely they are plasticizers of some sort. Thank you, Dr. Floss. Um, folks, I know you still have lots of questions in your mind, so please type your questions using the Q&A button below, and uh, we will be answering all of that um, in the longer Q&A toward the end of this webinar. So, Leah, for our next speaker. Yes, thank you, I, and thank you, Dr. Floss, for your presentation. Our next speaker is, again, one of the authors of the report, Dr. Laura Vandenberg. Dr. Vandenberg is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences in the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Trained as a developmental biologist and endocrinologist, Dr. Vandenberg's laboratory research examines the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals on function and disease of the mammary gland and other hormone sensitive outcomes. Dr. Vandenberg is an author on more than 100 peer reviewed papers and 12 book chapters. Folks, let's listen to Dr. Laura Vandenberg. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm gonna to continue where Dr. Flaws left off and continue with some examples that are common chemicals that are endocrine disruptors that are found in plastics. The first set of chemicals that I would like to talk about are UV stabilizing chemicals. These are chemicals that are added to products that protect them against damage from harmful UV radiation. They're also added to prevent the product itself from fading or from breaking down or to prevent corrosion and minimize fog. So these are commonly found in consumer plastics, in paints and in building materials. UV stabilizers are also added to personal care products, including many common sunscreens. What this means that is that as products are produced, as they are used, and even when used as intended, or when they're put on people's bodies, it contributes to exposures to individuals and also to release into the environment. An example of a common UV stabilizer is UV-328. This is a chemical that is environmentally persistent and thus has been proposed to be added to the Stockholm Convention. It's widely added to plastics and it's the small pieces of those plastics, microplastics that have been detected all around the world, including in environments where human action is not normally occurring. This suggests that this is a chemical that on the plastics that it is incorporated into can travel around the world. This is a chemical that's been measured in the bodies of wildlife and in humans, including in breast milk. And there's evidence for its anti-androgenic behavior in cell culture. Another class of chemicals are the brominated flame retardants. Plastics themselves are flammable. That should make sense to us because virtually all plastics are made with petroleum. So, Flame retardants are added to plastics and other household products as a way to reduce their flammability. Some of those flame retardants are brominated flame retardants, and some of those have been included in the Stockholm Convention. That's because they are persistent and bioaccumulative, and they also have toxic properties. Because the brominated flame retardants themselves are not actually bound to the plastics that they're included in, they can be released from those plastic products 
and then leach into the environment. This means that humans are exposed by inhalation, by ingestion of dust containing these chemicals, and also from ingestion of contaminated food and water. Brominated flame retardants are found in electronic casings, in textiles, in the foams that are found inside of furniture, in other upholstery, including carpeting, in building materials, in many plastic children's toys. And because a lot of plastics end up being recycled, those that originally contained brominated flame retardants means that these flame retardants end up inside recycled plastics. There's documentation of brominated flame retardants health effects on both people and wildlife. Exposures to brominated flame retardants have been associated with alterations to thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is essential for the development of the brain. This means that exposures to brominated flame retardants can contribute to altered neurodevelopment. There's also strong evidence that brominated flame retardants can affect male and female reproduction and the development of the reproductive organs. There are of course other endocrine disrupting chemicals that have been found in plastics. And we have not covered all of them in our talk here today. I just would like to highlight one more class that is deserving of attention. And this is the heavy metals, including lead and cadmium. Lead and cadmium are heavy metals that are added to plastics because they're useful as pigments, as stabilizers, and as catalyzers. This means that they can be found in children's toys, in carpeting, in electronics, and even in softer plastics. Lead is a known neurotoxin. There is no safe dose, no safe level of exposure for lead for children. Cadmium is a known kidney toxicant. It also can cause bone demineralization. Even at low doses, and in fact, maybe especially at low doses, these heavy metals can affect endocrine outcomes, including hormone levels in the body. They can contribute to increased infertility, and they can also contribute to hormone dependent cancers. So with the time that we have left, I would like to leave you with some thoughts about a call to action. What can we do? I hope that everything that we've presented to you today can impress upon you why this is an important topic. There are real life health impacts that have already been experienced by people and by wildlife populations that are exposed to endocrine disrupting chemicals that leach from plastics. As our production of plastics continues to increase globally, that means that we are likely to continue to have experience exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals, and also that we would expect that the problems associated with these exposures will continue to become worse. There is no sustainable way to deal with plastic waste, including all of the chemical additives that are contributing to plastic production. That means that prevention is key. Dr. Flaws showed you this graph, which indicates where we are currently in global plastic production in terms of the millions of metric tons produced each year. And this graph also predicts what our plastic production will be over the next several decades. What needs to happen is that this needs to stop. We need to be reducing our plastic production. In addition, we need to be thinking about alternative ways to create the plastics that we do need and how we can substitute or replace the most hazardous additives. But all of these ideas about substitution and replacement need to take into account the fact that even bioplastics, even the plastics that are not derived from fossil fuels that are pumped out of the ground will often contain chemical additives including things like UV stabilizers and pigments and dyes. And that it's these additives that we're very concerned about. So what can be done on the national level? Governments should consider enacting policies that will minimize exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals. This minimization of EDCs will protect workers who are exposed during the production of products it will protect the most vulnerable among us, including children that are being exposed, oftentimes even before they're born. 
And it will also protect downstream the effects that we've been documenting on wildlife and in environments. We believe that there's sufficient evidence that EDCs should be banned from plastics. We believe that people have the right to know about what's been added to the products that they use. And therefore there should be labeling and transparency, transparency about the chemicals that are included in those products. We believe that there are market-based solutions that can be used to promote companies that want to move away from the most hazardous substances towards more sustainable solutions. There are companies that are participating in these kinds of movements. What we need to ensure is that those companies are not moving from one hazardous chemical to another. These are referred to as regrettable replacements or regrettable substitutions, and those should be avoided. On an individual level, of course, we think that change really needs to occur at, at high levels, that regulatory action is needed to be able to protect consumers and, um, and the wildlife and environments in which we find ourselves. So what individuals can do is to engage with decision makers, to start speaking both from the local community, uh, regional areas, and all the way up to the national level. In the meantime, we have seen that changes in consumer behavior can shift markets. When people don't want to be exposed to chemicals that they're concerned about, they will change their shopping behaviors. There are things as an individual you can do, like refusing those single-use throwaway items and avoiding heating up plastic containers, avoiding putting um, hot drinks um, or food into those plastic containers, um, uh, using gentle cleaners in our homes um, and trying to shop for better products. So with this, um, we're going to conclude. Uh, I'm just going to remind you of this guide that was released in late 2020 that is available for free online and to acknowledge and thank our co-authors um, that worked on this guide um, together with Dr. Flaws, um, who is the lead author and myself. Um, at this time, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have about the materials that I presented um, and, uh, and anything else that you that I might be able to, to help you with in thinking about endocrine disrupting chemicals and plastics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Vandenberg, for your presentation. Now we'll uh, gladly take a couple of questions. Laura, yeah, that's fine. Um, yes, please. First, yeah, first, um, we have a number of Indonesian participants now, and um, uh, we even have Indonesia Bahasa interpretation going on. So, Indonesian researchers, in collaboration with French researchers, found that there were cases of fish that had abnormalities in their reproductive tract, which had uh, two tracts or were inter found to be intersexual. They claim, the French scientists, that um, these were caused by EDCs due to plastic waste that accumulates in the environment. Um, the participant want to know if uh, the fish consumed by people will have an effect on the human body. It's a great question. Um, this is not the first time that intersex um, wildlife have been observed downstream of um, endocrine disrupting chemical pollution. In the past, it was documented in areas where um, wastewater was collecting and that the wastewater often had a lot of ethanyl estradiol, which is the active ingredient in birth control. Um, and it's not surprising to find that um, wildlife, fish especially, exposed to birth control would um, have a higher incidence of intersex. Um, so I'm not aware of this specific study, but uh, the question of the consumption of fish raises two points. Number one, I think we should often see wildlife as um, as signals or sentinels for what those same chemicals could be doing to humans. So in that case, it's less the consumption of the fish that's the concern and more the fact that we all share an environment. And so if chemicals are affecting the reproductive health of wildlife, we should expect that they can affect the, re the reproductive health of humans. 
But I think the other point is, are those fish safe to eat? There's nothing inherently dangerous about eating a fish that is intersex. What could be dangerous is if the chemicals that are causing that intersex are persistent, in which case they're, they're likely to still be present in the bodies of those fish or in the bodies of other fish in the same water. So it's less the, the biology of the fish um, having an abnormal reproduction and more the nature of the chemicals that could be causing that. Um, and the, I assume the researchers have some sense of what those chemicals might be. Um, and and that, that would worry me about eating any food that comes from um, an environment that has persistent um, and bioaccumulative chemicals. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, we have another question um, from uh, John Dell. Do you think green screen type of certifications that hide the exact chemical additive formula are good or are legitimate? I see this being advertised, but I'm suspicious. Wouldn't full transparency of additives be better or are green screen tests and certification a good step forward? Thank you for that question, too. Um, I think sometimes we get caught up in um, wanting the perfect and we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I think anything that gets us to more transparency, whether it's about what's known about the toxicity, the, the health association of ingredients in products, or if it's about the ingredients themselves, um, either of those is better than where we are right now. Um, green screens are, um, at least to my knowledge, are, are um, voluntary. So companies that participate in them, they're kind of taking a stance that they want to do the right thing. Um, now, green screens are, are dependent on what's the available evidence at any moment when the green screen is conducted. And our knowledge changes over time. So it's important that those green screens are um, revised and that um, as, as product formulation changes, that you rescreen um, the chemicals that are included in products. But I don't want us to think that we, the only solution here is um, to have a full listing of all of the ingredients in plastics in order to use plastics. I think I think um, the green screen uh, offers an opportunity sort of as a mid step before um, full transparency and we should welcome it from companies that are willing to do it. Thank you for that, uh, Laura, and thank you for the question also. Um, our last uh, question for this um, uh, portion, uh, don't worry, we will have a bigger, a longer question and answer um, forum later. Um, Laura, if you may, um, thank you for your very instructive actions that can be done. No? Um, you cited them. Can you share some real life examples of right to know policies or market based solutions that you know have been enacted or have been implemented to minimize exposure to EDCs? Um, I can't actually. I think that in general, this is an area where we have failed. Now, my knowledge is largely the US-based knowledge. Um, so that's where I work and that's where I live. And um, in the United States, we do have laws around disclosure for ingredients in food, as an example. But there's a lot of, um, of workarounds, right, that things like flavorings can be included as, um, as like a category. So even where we think we have good disclosure laws, um, they're not so great. Um, I, I have seen very little success in this area. Um, and I, I honestly think it's an area that's deserving of real attention from policymakers to identify the kinds of loopholes that could potentially be misused before we start implementing laws that end up um, not being so useful and then we'll find out later. So unfortunately there's not there's not good examples that I'm aware of. Okay thank you for that Laura and uh, friends we have to stop at this point so that we could go to our third presentation but don't worry uh, we can uh, have more questions uh, to be answered later. 
I turn you now over uh, back to Eileen to introduce the third and final speaker. Thank you, Leah. So last and certainly not the least is IPEN's very own beloved co-chair, Pamela Miller. Pamela is the founder of Alaska Community Action on Toxics and serves as ACAT's executive director. She has more than 35 years of research, education, and advocacy experience and work passionately for environmental and reproductive justice, health, and human rights. Pamela was elected in 2016 as co-chair of IPEN. She serves as a principal investigator for community-based participatory research projects funded by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Pamela received a Meritorious Service Award from the University of Alaska and Alaska Conservation Foundation's Ulaus Muri Award in recognition of her long-term outstanding professional contributions to the conservation movement in Alaska. The floor is now yours, Pam. Well, greetings, everyone. This is Pam Miller calling in from Alaska, also the traditional and unceded lands of the Denina peoples here in Alaska. And I have the privilege to serve as co-chair of IPEN, as well as executive director of Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Thank you all so much for joining and greetings to all. And thank you to the organizers. And thank you to Jody and Laura of the Endocrine Society for their excellent presentations. In July, there was a remarkable report of the United Nations Special Rapporteur, Marcos Orlana, who spoke of and delivered a report on the stages of the plastics life cycle and their impact on human rights. This was remarkable for so many reasons because it recognizes the need for global action to address this crisis. And not just the visible crisis, but also the fact that the plastics problem is a life cycle issue from the extraction of fossil fuels to the disposal and use of, of plastics and the chemicals in these plastics. The report recognized that plastics contain many, many toxic add additives, over 10,000 according to a recent study. And it also recognized most importantly that safeguarding human rights of present and future generations that are compromised by the growing toxification of the planet demands that the international community reverse this plastics crisis. So it, it's an urgent call for action. And this is a call to action from some of the indigenous leaders that we work with in the Arctic who are working with us in conducting research on the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the north. These chemicals are carried on wind and ocean currents from many hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles away, and they accumulate in the bodies of fish, wildlife, and people of the north. And this is a call to action based on our own community-based research and the findings that show high levels of chemicals in people as well as animals, but also plastics that are showing up in these animals, in the seabirds, in the whales, in the people. These are some images of the place where we conduct our community-based research on the island called Suvukok, also known as St. Lawrence Island in the Northern Bering Sea. We recognize that the North and the Arctic is a hemispheric sink, not only for chemicals, but also plastics that are carried on wind and ocean currents into this region. And Arctic indigenous peoples who rely on a traditional diet, mostly from the sea, are especially vulnerable to the effects of these chemicals and plastics and have some of the highest levels of chemicals, these persistent organic pollutants of any population on earth. The Arctic is warming at three times the rate of the rest of the planet. And this is exacerbating the mobilization and transport of chemicals that have been sequestered and also microplastics that have been sequestered in permafrost and in sea ice and in glaciers that are now being released into these places 
that are so important for the traditional culture of indigenous peoples of the Arctic. These are some of the results from a research cruise that was conducted to look at the density and proliferation of microplastics that have arrived on ocean currents from many sources in lower latitudes and documented the fact that the Arctic Ocean now contains the most plastics of any ocean basin on earth because it is a sink for, again, not only chemicals, but plastics. And these microplastics are found in the surface, in the sediments, in the deep, in the deep sea, as well as on beaches. It's really remarkable to see the proliferation of microplastics that are arriving in the Arctic. And again, this is not just a problem of the microplastics themselves, but the fact that these microplastics carry toxic chemicals that have been additives in the plastics as well as the chemicals that have been absorbed as they float around in the ocean. These microplastics are found in so many species of wildlife from fish to whales, including sperm whales, beluga whales, as well as many seabirds. This slide shows in the fossil fuel and chemicals industries own projections about how they're investing in chemicals and plastics and the fact that they are by their own projections, expecting exponential increases in the plastics and chemicals production as the demand for fossil fuels for combustion really is declining with, with the um, increasing reliance on renewable energy. This slide demonstrates that Chemicals, chemical additives are a problem throughout the life cycle of plastics from the extraction of oil and gas for the production of chemicals and plastics to the production itself, the use by consumers and the problems of, of these chemicals being released in our homes, the recycling, which is largely a myth, and the ultimate problem of incineration and disposal, which is usually felt most by um, communities really on the front lines and people are disproportionately affected in poor communities throughout the global south. These are some of the policy targets that IPEN has identified that are very critically important. And I think one of the important outcomes of the report of the UN Rapporteur was that even given all of these global agreements, that they're not enough really to address the global plastics problem. So we really, while these, these agreements are very important and have important mechanisms to address parts of the global plastics crisis, we need really a new and comprehensive approach to addressing this massive problem. The Stockholm Convention is really critically important because it does focus on elimination rather than managing risk. It allows for the addition of new chemicals and it is therefore a living treaty. It's global and legally binding. It is based on the precautionary principle and so far 26 persistent organic pollutants have been listed for elimination, two with restrictions and seven for elimination of unintentional releases such as dioxins and furans. And several of these chemicals that have been listed are hazardous chemicals and plastics. And I should say that there are now 185 parties to the convention and Alaska Community Action on Toxics is really involved in the Stockholm Convention because Arctic indigenous peoples do have some of the highest levels of these persistent organic pollutants of any population on earth. The statue in the lower right corner is a statue that was given by the Inuit Circumpolar Council to the delegates of the Stockholm Convention to remind them that this is not an abstract issue, that these chemicals affect the life and health of women, children, and future generations. 
These are some of the chemicals that have been listed under the Stockholm Convention that are plastics additives. One of the ones, one of the substances that is under current consideration and is currently being evaluated by the expert committee of the Stockholm Convention is an ultraviolet light stabilizer called UV328. This is a high production chemical additive that absorbs you that absorbs UV light in many types of plastics. It does under, undergo long range transport, primarily carried through plastics in the marine environment. And it was nominated by Switzerland in 2020. It has a very, um, I think, important precedent here that this is a quote from the Secretariat of the Stockholm Convention Given UV 328's proliferation in plastic products, such a listing would strengthen the Stockholm Convention's role as a key additional instrument for governments across the globe to tackle the growing plastic waste crisis. And it's found in seabirds throughout the world in recent studies. This is another chemical that's currently under evaluation by the Stockholm Convention's expert committee called Dechlorine Plus. This is a high volume flame retardant additive to plastics. It's used in a variety of consumer products and industrial applications. And it's considered a replacement chemical for the listed chemical DECA BDE, another flame retardant. It was proposed by Norway and it's distributed throughout the global environment, including remote regions such as the Arctic and Antarctic. And it has serious human health effects. It's been, been detected in many um, human samples, including hair, umbilical cord blood, blood serum, and breast milk, and has a variety of adverse health effects. Another chemical that's currently under evaluation is one that's very important to me because this was produced in my hometown of Dover, Ohio, here in the United States, and resulted in a super fun site of one of the most highly contaminated sites in the country and resulted also in a cancer cluster in my community and within my family. So this one is personal to me. This is considered a replacement chemical for the listed chemicals, short chain chlorinated paraffin. So the chemical industry is merely doing its regrettable substitution thing by substituting this type of um, um, the medium chain chlorinated paraffins for the short chain chlorinated paraffins that have largely been phased out. This is found in remote regions. It's um, very highly toxic, especially to, to these different organ systems, liver, kidney, thyroid, and so on here listed. And this is one that we're gonna fight very hard for. These next slides show some of the recent reports of IPEN. I won't go into this one because I know that Laura and uh, Jody will be talking about it, but this is a very important report done in collaboration with the Endocrine Society for which we are very grateful. This was a report released last April about aquatic pollutants in oceans and fisheries. And I think it's, it's really important because it shows um, that exposures to environmental pollutants ad adversely affect the fertility, behavior, resilience, recruitment, and survival of many aquatic species. And these include endocrine effects in, in the aquatic environment. This was a report published in the journal Chemosphere, which shows the evidence about old banned chemicals such as dioxins and furans um, being detected in new plastic products, including toys that can contribute to human exposures, particularly in children. This was a report showing the false solutions of plastic waste being disposed of in ways that poison communities and people and the food chain in communities in Africa, Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, as well as Latin America. So again, thinking of 
incineration and waste to fuels systems really as false solutions for the disposal of plastic waste. And this demonstrates that plastics and plastics disposal in, in these ways such as incineration result in contamination of the food web. This was a report co-authored by uh, Lee Bell and Shige Takata, again, looking at the management hazards from plastics in schemes such as so-called chemicals recycling, plastics to fuel and mechanical recycling, again, pointing out the fact that these methods of disposal result in widespread contamination and human health concerns. This is the mighty IPEN network of which many of you are a part and it really will take all of us working, to get, working together to address these global issues and together we are stronger. IPEN has developed a, a views document on global controls on plastics and I won't go through all of these issues but basically the goal is eliminating the toxic impacts of chemicals in every phase of plastics, um, including the production, transport, use, and disposal. And these are some of the basic principles that IPEN is both advocating for and supporting. These are some publications that our community-based research team has produced investigating the effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the Arctic. And if you would like to have this as a reference, I'm very glad to provide it. And I, th I thank you for your attention today. I really appreciate it. This is Annie Aloha, one of our elders who has inspired this community-based research on endocrine disrupting chemicals because as a community health worker and elder, she observed, observed health disparities associated with military toxics and other sources of chemicals on Sivoka. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our esteemed speakers. Thank you, Jody, Laura, and Tam. Let's give the three, our three esteemed speakers a virtual round of applause, friends. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are truly honored uh, to have you speak today. So folks, um, we are now opening the floor for questions from the audience. We would like to request Laura, Jody, and Tam. Um, to turn on your videos, please, and uh, we will take turns answering the questions. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you so much to Pam. Uh, it's very, an, uh, it's an ungodly hour. Uh, we know where you are. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us live uh, today. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so first, um, question from Ida. How do we secure that the chemical aspect of plastics and you, all of the three of you have really um, brought out no, the many uh, evidence of how the chemical additives uh, harm uh, human health and the environment. Um, how do we secure that the chemical aspect of, pal of plastics is included in the future policies? It seems the trend is largely, the focus is largely on CO CO2 and climate change um, while important but uh, how do we get the concern on chemicals in plastics sufficiently covered who would like to take a first crack at that how about you pam because you I think pam sit, should start <laughs> yeah yeah pam can start pam sits uh, friends pam um, as you as mentioned by eileen earlier uh, pam sits in the pop rock uh, pop uh, review committee, POPs review committee, and also monitors no, the many different uh, global uh, international policies. Yeah. Pam? Thank you. And it is early. So if I don't answer um, comprehensively, you'll know that it's because it's early. Um, well, thank you all. That's a very good question and, and quite a complex one, I, I would say. I think, first of all, um, we need to take action at local and national levels to ensure right to know, to end the use of single use plastics and end all non-determined and end non-essential uses 
of plastics, but as we recognize, this really is a global problem that requires global action. And the, some of the international mechanisms that I mentioned, I think are very crucial. I didn't have a, a lot of chance to talk about the Basel Convention, but that is also an important mechanism to uh, reduce and eliminate the international transport of toxics in plastics. The Stockholm Convention is an important mechanism because it, it is the only legally binding agreement that we have to phase out chemicals, including chemicals and plastics like UV-328. That's gonna be a big struggle because we know already that the oil um, and gas, fossil fuel industry and chemical industry and plastics industry is fighting very hard against that listing. So we really have our work cut out for us. And also governments like the US that I think have a vested interest in a close tie with the chemical industry are opposing that listing as well. But as I mentioned, uh, all of these international mechanisms are really not enough and that we do need a, a more comprehensive approach to addressing the life cycle of plastics. And so that's why many are calling for a global treaty on plastics that does address, and IPEN's view is that we have to address plastics and toxic additives to plastics throughout the life cycle. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, it, don't worry, it doesn't seem like you, you're, uh, you just woke up for, for, for your uh, great answer. Thank you. Anything to add, Laura, Jody? I, I was just going to say that I think that when we do think about policy, one of the places that we have erred, and I, I put myself in that bucket of we, um, is to often focus on single chemicals at a time. Um, and that's where I think we need to change. Um, you know, a lot of action was taken and it took years for it to even get to, to any actual policy um, or regulation on BPA. Um, and then we just end up with BPA replacement chemicals, um, which was never the intention in considering the science behind why we were worried about BPA. So I think we, when we do think about policy, when we do put our heads together and come up with a solution, the solution needs to be focused on the actions of the chemicals and not the individual identities of chemicals. So I will, just, I will just add one thing. So I, I'm gonna put myself in this we category too. I think when we're thinking about policy, we need to not only think about mixtures and additive nature of chemicals, but we need to think broadly through the entire lifespan. So a lot of EDC work has been focused on exposures during pregnancy, which is really important, but we also have to realize that there are other critical times in the lifespan for exposure, um, during puberty, during menopause, during reproductive aging, during aging in general. And so really looking at making policies that will encompass the entire lifespan of exposure. Thank you. Thank you I for did want to add one, one thing, and I, I totally agree with Laura that a class approach is needed at all levels. And I think one of the commenters in the chat noted that in the states, a number of states are, are taking action to, to eliminate classes of chemicals in certain product categories, such as PFAS and firefighting foams and food packaging textiles and other uses, the class approach is absolutely necessary from a local to, to an international level. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, Eileen, you have a question for the um, panelists? Yes, yes, Leah. Um, question came from Vito. Um, it's for Dr. Vandenberg. So the question is, um, it came across that plastics don't really function without um, toxic chemicals based on your presentations. Can plastics work without toxic UV stabilizers or other additives? Or Thanks. isn't then that the problem is the plastic itself rather than the additives? So, yeah, Dr. Laura? It's, it, yeah. it's sort of circular logic, and I can see um, where that can be problematic. Um, I, I do think that anything that is that is created and used and then thrown away and will not break down in the environment is something we should be worried about 
even if it didn't have hazardous properties, because we only have so much space on earth to deal with our waste. And I think we need to be more thoughtful about waste. Um, but I, I do think that there is something that we are learning that is inherent to many of the chemicals that are added to plastics. Does that mean that all plastics are necessarily hazardous to health? No, I, I don't think that that's actually true. But in reality, plastics that are made with one chemical compound are extremely rare. Um, so one of the questions that was posed was about um, uh, single use drinking water bottles, um, which are very common and are an important source of clean water in some communities, water that you can count on to not um, pass along communicable diseases. And those plastic water bottles are usually polypropylene or polyethylene, which are building blocks that are of lower concern when it comes to EDCs. The problem is that they're never just polypropylene or polyethylene. There's usually a dye added to them, or there's a UV stabilizer added to them, or there's um, you know, pigments that are added uh, to put a label on them. Um, oftentimes the plastic water bottle itself has a plastic uh, label um, band around the outside of it, which will contain um, who knows what. And so I think part of what we need to be thinking about and what Dr. Flaws sort of hinted at is plastics are a mixtures issue. And when we think about them, we need to be thinking about all of the ingredients that go into making those plastics. And, and so we want all of the ingredients to be safe. Um, and that's a very difficult question. Um, and another point that was um, uh, hinted at by one of the questions um, from Dr. Jen Sass that, that I think is very important um, is what are the methods that are used to evaluate the safety of these chemicals? And um, her question was really, or her point was really, around the methods that are used in green screens are often fairly poor methods for evaluating toxicity. They rely on test guidelines, which evaluate estrogenicity with changes to, as an example, the weight of the uterus and a rodent, which is a pretty insensitive measure of estrogen action. So we're, we're kind of, again, caught in this catch-22 where an ingredient might appear to be safe and used in plastics, and it might not actually be safe, it's just poorly tested or it's tested with insensitive methods. Um, and then when we look at the bottom of a plastic water bottle, we make assumptions based on the number that's stamped at the bottom about what's in that plastic water bottle. But there's this whole mystery of other things that have been added to that bottle that is not revealed by finding the one or the three or the seven on the bottom. Thank you, Laura. Anything to add, Jody or Pam, on that question? If not, we can go to the next. Okay. Sure. So next uh, question, um, we'll take the one from Alejandra. Um, uh, she wonders what are the effects of all the plastic in the ocean? Uh, what would be the effect of all the EDCs and um, its interference in wildlife and uh, for the for next hundreds of years? Is there any projection about this? Well, I think um, our, our colleagues who, who referenced the work that's being done um, in areas with heavy plastic pollution, um, revealing effects on intersex in fish, um, that's one of many, many studies that have been done in wildlife. And the wildlife, again, they're telling us um, the story as, as sort of sentinel species for what we can expect to see in other more difficult to study species, including humans. Um, I think in areas that are around human activity, so we think about the vast oceans, um, but oceans meet land and in the area around the land where we can see and measure higher levels of contamination, um, there is reason to be concerned. One of the chemicals that we study in my lab is oxybenzone or benzophenone 3. It's added to plastics as a UV stabilizer, but it's more commonly used in personal care products, um, in sunscreens, for example. 
And in the beaches around Hawaii, it has been detected in relatively high levels because it washes off of beachgoers um, into the oceans. And this chemical has been shown at very low concentrations to affect the health of coral. It alters the skeleton of the coral. Um, so ultimately uh, affects the long-term health of coral reefs. This is just one example of many that demonstrates that in our oceans, in areas closer to human activity, we can already document that effects are being seen. For many years, there was this um, saying that I find horrifying, which is uh, dilution is the solution for pollution. And we treated our oceans like a big garbage dump with this assumption that they were so vast that we don't need to worry about what's going to happen to them. And uh, we should not think about them in that way for so many reasons, including, you know, our connections to this planet are important, um, but also because those oceans come right up against where we live, where we farm, where we um, collect uh, food species, and it is affecting us as well. Thank you. Yeah, powerful statements, Laura. Thanks. And um, Laura, the studies you mentioned are referenced in the in the guide, no? In the plastics and EDC guide, correct? The wildlife studies that you said are they no, there? No, that's a great question, Jody. Did we did we talk much about wildlife in in the guide? So we have a little in there, but really the focus was on human health. Um, so we may have some of them in there, but not as many. Um, it's almost like we need an entire separate guide that addresses the wildlife issues. But there I is a great, that, yeah. <laughs> there is a, a few years old um, scientific uh, statement that came from the Endocrine Society. Um, it's quite long. I think it's about 150 pages but it's, um, it's freely available. And I think I can post a link to it in the chat. So you don't need um, a library subscription to access it. And it yes. covers wildlife, human, laboratory animals. Um, so great. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, great. So that everyone uh, interested can access. Thank you. Uh, Pam, you wanted to share something? Yes, ahead, I'll put please. This, thank you. I'll put this in the chat too. I mentioned the uh, another IPEN report called Aquatic Pollutants in Oceans and Fisheries, and that reviews a lot of the scientific evidence about harm in the aquatic and marine environments, including endocrine disrupting chemicals. So I'll, I'll post a link to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, dear speakers, for the additional resources. Eileen, back to you. Um, yes, Leah. Actually, we have so many great questions in the Q&A box, and uh, some of them were already answered by our esteemed speakers. So, But then we have few participants from Japan, and they also have questions from our, for our speakers. This one's from Koa, and uh, his question is, most of the chemicals which are produced by combining carbon with chlorine and other halogens act as EDC. So... Do you think we should stop producing chemicals utilizing chlorine or halogens? So that's the question. I mean, my view is that, and, and I think this is supported by several um, international bodies of experts, is that there are chemicals that we consider to have essential uses, and then there's literally everything else. So it, there, there may be real reasons to need a small number of chemicals that involve um, uh, carbon to fluorine, fluorine bonds or carbon to bromine bonds. Um, but I would guess that the vast majority of those chemicals are not actually essential or the, many of their uses are not actually essential. Um, I think, again, this comes back to that, um, that point about can we regulate chemicals as classes or can we at least group them into classes and within those classes decide that, um, that these are prioritized and their uses should be limited as much as possible. Um, I think that the, the question really hits on the ones that worry us the most. Thank you. Um... And then this will have to be our last question. Um, 
sorry folks uh how can what's your thoughts uh, on how can uh, we properly dispose of contaminated plastic we're all laughing because <laughs> um you know i think uh it was very depressing to me a few years ago to really realize what was happening to plastics that i thought i was recycling um you know on an individual level we're all trying to do the right thing right we're, i say i say this i teach you know large groups of of college students and i ask them do they recycle and everyone says that they do um, we're all trying our best, but the actual realization of what happens to the plastic that goes into your recycling bin, um, it's pretty depressing. So I think the there's a few things that we can do, which is if you can say no to it, you should say no. Um, it, and even if it's a convenience thing, say no. Um, like I've just given, I don't need a straw. Um, I much prefer to drink through a straw because that's my preference, but I, you, I just don't need a straw. So I'm just saying no to straws. I know that straws became a symbol and a kind of a silly symbol for plastics, um, but it's a simple thing that we can do where we can say, I don't need that. But the other thing that we need to do is to vote with our pocketbooks. Um, to not spend money with companies that refuse to acknowledge the damage that's being done by the plastics that they're um, that they're creating and to use the power of your network to demand that change happen because um, I, I honestly think that that regulation and policy are great tools but they move very slowly and consumers, and I hate to consider myself as a consumer, like I'm a human, but consumer behavior is what actually moves change. And we've seen that happen. And I, I think it's where we have the a, a tremendous amount of power. Yeah, I agree with what Laura is saying. You know, the question is really hard to answer and policy and change that way does move very slowly. So I think just saying no to as much plastic as you possibly can, um, reducing and eliminating it is the only way to go right now. I agree with that certainly. And I also think that in many respects, and, and we do have choices to make and, and we need to make those. And it's also true that we can't shop our way out of this problem, which is why we need policies in place to prevent false solutions like incineration and waste uh, waste to energy kinds of schemes and so-called chemicals recycling, which the you know, chemical industry and, and many governments are promoting as, a, as a, a false solution to dealing with plastic waste. We need real solutions. We need to eliminate the use of, of uh, these plastics as much as possible. Thank you, Pam, for your wonderful answer, Dr. Laura and Dr. Jody. But then I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today, folks. We would like to thank our speakers for patiently answering all the questions posed today. And so to formally close the program, may we once again invite Griffins to give the closing remarks. Griffins. Thank you very much. And thank you all, uh, Dr. Laura, uh, Dr. Jody, uh, Pam, uh, very nice to see you. And for this, and of course, our wonderful moderators, Eileen and Leah, for this uh, wonderful webinar. It's been so much uh, rich information. I think as the co-chair of the Plastic Toxic Plastic Working Group and as, as IPEN, this is one of our objectives to pro provide uh, information and factual information uh, to the public on the issues of hazardous chemicals. And I think this really fits in with our objectives and the strategy that we have in the working group, uh, developing the working group in trying to bring out the invisible uh, information uh, more than what is visible as we know, plastic uh, bottles and uh, other items. So I think, uh, thank you very much all. Uh, not to take so much time, we want to appreciate and we look forward to other insightful and uh, welcoming you again for another webinar next time. So uh, I'm very grateful and I want to thank uh, all the organizers and everyone at IPEN to uh, put this time of their time to put this forward. So thank you very much and uh, back to you, uh, Leah. And
Yes, thank you, Griffins. And again, thank you to our esteemed speakers. Uh, thank you to all attendees. Thank you also to the translators. We have a number of translators uh, really catching up now with all the discussions we had today. And thank you to the support staff, um, the webinar team from Echo Waste Coalition. So thank you so much, everyone. Please don't forget to complete the post-webinar survey that will flash in your screen after the program. Thank you all and take care.